All right, welcome back to the Ranking of Kings series. And welcome to one of the big ones, one of King's most famous, most important works, and that is 1986's It. And this edition that I have read is the Signet edition from 1987. Uh, this is pretty much for me nostalgia in a book form. Uh, this is how I always picture it. And I like that they didn't focus on the Pennywise clown aspect on here. We'll talk a little bit about why I like that as we go through this review. So this was my third time reading it, and I liked it more than ever. I think this is a book that you can return to multiple times throughout your life at different ages and get different things out of it. It contains some of King's best writing and some of his most memorable characters. All right, so synopsis. Um, it is an ancient, powerful alien force, and over the centuries, it has fed upon the small town of Derry, Maine. It's fed upon its bodies, its heart, and its soul, corrupting the town and its inhabitants to its very core. It's up to seven misfit kids, affectionately known as the Losers Club, to stand up to it and destroy the evil. But they have to return to Derry as adults to make sure that the evil is truly dead at any cost. So I'm going to read a couple passages during this review, and we're going to read the first one now. Um, this passage takes place pretty close to the middle of the book, the first time that the characters have come back together as adults. And this is, there was a moment of silence among the six of them that was beyond description. It was one of the strangest moments Bill Dimbro ever passed in his life. Stan was not here, but a seventh had come nonetheless. Here in this private restaurant and dining room, Bill felt its presence so fully that it was almost personified, but not as an old man in a white robe with a scythe on his shoulder. It was the white spot on the map with lay, which lay between 1958 and 1985, an area an explorer might have called the Great Don't Know. Bill wondered what exactly was there. Beverly Marsh, Marsh in a short skirt which showed most of her long cultish legs, a Beverly Marsh in white go-go boots, her hair parted in the middle and ironed, Richie Tozer carrying a sign which said stop the war on one side and get ROTC off campus on the other. Ben Hanscom in a yellow hard hat with a flag decal on the front, running a bulldozer under a canvas par parasol, his shirt off, showing a stomach which protruded less and less over the waistband of his pants. Was this seventh creature black, no relation to either H. Rap Brown or Grandmaster Flash? Not this fellow. This fellow wore plain white shirts and fade into the woodwork J.C. Penny slacks, and he sat in a library corral at the University of Maine, writing papers on the origin of footnotes and the possible advantages of ISBN numbers in book cataloging, while the marches marched outside and Phil Oakes sang, Richard Nixon, find yourself another country to be the part of. And men died with their stomachs blown out for villages whose names they could not pronounce. He sat there studiously, bent over his work. Bill saw him, which lay in a slant of crisp white winter light, his face sober and absorbed, knowing that to be a librarian, a librarian was to come as close as any human being can to sitting in the peak seat of eternity's engine. My God, that is a freaking fantastic sentence. Oh man, uh, was he the seventh or was it a young man standing before the mirror looking at the way his forehead was growing, looking at a comb full of pulled out red hairs, looking at a pile of university notebooks on the desk reflected in the mirror, notebooks which held the completed messy first draft of a novel entitled Joanna, which would be published a year later. Some of the above, all of the above, none of the above. 
it didn't really it didn't matter really the seventh was there and in that one moment they all felt it and perhaps understood best the dreadful power of the thing that had brought them back it lives bill thought cold inside his clothes eye of newt tail of dragon hand of glory whatever it was it's here again in dairy it man what a fantastic passage so I've uh, mentioned before that I think King is a master at structure and it might be the book that exemplifies this best. It is one of his most tightly structured novels and the table of contents provides the reader with a detailed map and timeline of what is about to uh, happen, of what we are getting into as the reader. And I consider this a great strength, especially for a book of this kind of massive length, a book over a thousand pages. Uh, through the use of time jumps, repetition in chapter names, and signaling, King creates a map to keep us on the track of the book. The structure is also super important in how it jumps from past to present. Uh, this is a very crucial element to the book, and it's something that was ignored in the film version to its detriment. Now, I'm not here to compare the book and the film. That's not something I do. I just raised that uh, point to show how strong the structure is in the book. There are two parts to the story, the part of the, ki of the characters as kids and the part with them as adults. The film version separates those two parts without hardly any connection between the two. The book doesn't. In the book, we start off in 1957, and then immediately we go to the present uh, through 1984 into 1985, where we meet our characters as adults. Then we have one of the greatest uh, these sections here, the first interlude and the second interlude and the uh, fourth interlude, third and uh, the last interlude, where Mike Hanlon, my favorite character in the book, is writing about dairy and we learn about the history of the town. Then we go back in time to 1958, where the kids are first learning about it. The kids are growing up. They're learning about the evil in their world. We have another interlude. And then we return to them as grown-ups. And then we go back in time again. We have another interlude. And then this final part, part five, is so masterfully done, it just effortlessly switches back and forth between the past, the present, between the point of view of the kids, the point of view of the town of Derry, and the point of view of it, the evil. And it's so well done. And we really need that kind of structure for this book to work the way it does. That jumping back and forth, that shifting between points of view. And so we really get a sense of how things are interconnected. Now the book is called It, and um, It is a great presence of evil. But It as a villain, it doesn't do a lot for me in the way that it does some other people. So it as a clown, as Pennywise, really does nothing for me. Um, I do not think clowns are scary. I don't think they're creepy. I don't have any of that. Um, I simply don't find clowns very interesting at all. I get that I'm not really supposed to. It's more important that the fear of the characters in, is conveyed. Um, and I'm also not really on board with it taking the form of the universal monsters like the Wolfman, uh, Frankenstein's monster, the, the mummy, that kind of stuff. Again, those types of monsters, those types of uh, scares just don't do much for me. But again, it was through the characters that that fear needed to be conveyed. And I think the book does that. I just don't find a lot of those sections very interesting. However, it as the cosmic entity as a great ancient old one, a force of alien evil that has come to earth and that has permeated the very culture, the very heart of the city in which it dwells. And it as a force that compels adults to forget, to turn a blind eye and to engage in evil is utterly fascinating for me. And I think the best representation of that evil is Henry Bowers. Now, I've often said that King's like second in command villain is almost always more interesting than the main villain. And that is totally true here. Henry Bowers as a childhood bully is utterly terrifying. And it's one of my all time favorite um, 
King villains. And I also really like it when the book at the end room, when it goes into its point of view. And we have this in chapter 21, Under the City, It, August 1958. Something new had happened, for the first time in forever, something new. Before the universe, there had been only two things. One was itself, and the other was the turtle. The turtle was a stupid old thing that never came out of its shell. It thought that maybe the turtle was dead, had been dead for the last billion years or so. Even if it wasn't, it was still a stupid old thing. And even if the turtle had vomited the universe out whole, that didn't change the fact of its stupidity. It had come here long after the turtle withdrew into its shell, here to Earth. And it had discovered a depth of imagination here that was almost new, almost of concern. This quality of imagination made the food very rich. Its teeth rent, flesh gone stiff with exotic terrors and voluptuous fears. They dreamed of night beasts and moving muds. Against their will, they contemplated endless gulfs. So those parts where it is being like its cosmic horror self is really, really great. But the main reason why it works, and it, it works as, as such a massive novel, and it never feels boring, it's always exciting, it's always engaging, is really because of the characters, and it's really because of the Losers Club. Bill, Eddie, Bev, Mike, Ben, Richie, and Stan. Uh, these are seven of the most endearing characters, I think, to ever grace the pages of genre fiction. Uh, they feel very real. The most real thing is their love for each other. It's so powerfully on display in this book. Yes, the friends, they rank each other out, you know, with shit like your mama jokes, but it's always done out of love, out of friendship. And the friends are never, they're never afraid to express their love for one another. They hug, nor are they afraid to cry around each other. As a matter of fact, they encourage it. They encourage the sharing of emotion. And this is a genuine friendship. Perhaps it's only really the kind of friendship that can exist in novels, but it's also the kind that many of us wish for. It works because the kids in the book are kids. They care about kid things, even though they're up against the world. Uh, they care about riding bikes, about building forts, about reading comic books, uh, about hanging out in the library, about discovering new things. Kids things in a kid's world but the world that they are living is intruded, intruded upon by an evil. You know, it's an evil that the adults in their lives either can't see or, or worse, straight up choose to ignore. Uh, their love for each other even manifests itself in the controversial ending where a young Bev has sex with each of the boys. I think this is a very powerful moment, even though it is a little controversial. Uh, the act of sexual love is a binding force that brings the kids, brings this group back together. While it also acts as a bridge between their adult selves and their childhood memories. The kids love each other in every way that love can manifest. And that's the only way that they're able to stand up to the ancient cosmic horror of it. I think one of the problems of it, if it, it does, it does have a problem, and its main problem is it's a little bit unfocused in its theming. It's about a lot of things, and you know this compared to Pet Cemetery, which I think is also one of Stephen King's masterpieces, which Pet Cemetery is laser focused on one theme. It is kind of about the double-edged nature of nostalgia, about uh, generational trauma child abuse, the evil of apathy, and the pain behind the smiles in childhood. It's about so much and it's really hard to nail down one thing that King was trying to say. But that doesn't have to be an issue because it is an epic book with an epic scope. But I think at the book's core is a universal truth of love and friendship. And I think that is ultimately what King wants his readers to take away. All right, so let's take a look at the uh, placard here. We've got the It placard. 
just drew seven little kind of stick figures to represent the Losers Club there with a little clown face in between it and the uh, pipe sewer leading into the depths underneath Derry. And so if we take a look here at our rankings right now, um, some of you may just want to think of the Dark Tower books as being rated separately because I'm pretty sure most of them are going to be at the very top of this list. But we have Dark Tower 1, The Gunslinger, Pet Cemetery, Mist, Desperation, Skeleton Crew, Cycle of the Werewolf, Tommyknockers, Firestarter, and Needful Things. Um, this was a little difficult, but I have decided to put it right beneath Pet Cemetery. That is where it's going to go. Um, I rank Pet Cemetery higher only because it's so expertly laser focused on its theme. It's one of the most tightly themed horror books I've ever read. And it's also shorter and therefore I think it's easier to revisit and to engage in its theme. It is kind of a, um, it's an event book. It's an every few years book. I could easily see myself reading Pet Cemetery every year because you can get through it so quickly. Uh, this was a hard decision, though, because I really love it a lot. So that is the uh, rankings so far. The Gunslinger, Pet Cemetery, It, The Mist, Desperation, Skeleton Crew, Cycle of the Werewolf, Tommyknockers, Firestarter, and Needful Things. Coming up next shortly will be The Dark Tower, Book 2, The Drawing of the Three. So all right, guys, we well, hope you enjoyed this uh, look at Stephen King's It, and we will talk to you later. Bye-bye.